uh, a lot of people might be wondering, or a lot of people already know, what exactly is Sir Orno's protocol? What exactly does it do? And will it introduce any upgrades in the future? Because it is not only Casey behind the team of the Orinals protocol, there's an immensely talented team behind the protocol working day in and day out on fine tuning it and introducing upgrades in the future. They're basically shaping our industry at this critical point leading up to the halving. So what can we be looking forward to from this point on? What new upgrades can we be looking, anticipating moving forward? Let's welcome Raf Chaff, lead maintainer of the Ordinals Protocol. Hey guys, nice to be here on stage. Um, yeah, I'm Raf. I'm currently the lead maintainer uh, of, of, of Ord, of the Ordinals Protocol. Um, yeah, less than a year ago, I, I, I was a uh, was a master's student in, in Germany, uh, and now yeah, I lead the Ordinals Protocol and uh, yeah, try to bring stuff forward. Um, the, the last year has been pretty crazy for me. Um, like we, we launched this in, in January, and a lot has happened. And this presentation is more of a you know like some some lessons I learned along the way, and uh, yeah, what what we can what we can see in the future. Um, normally, I like to do kind of like workshops. I, I sit on my laptop in the terminal, so some cool new features. But yeah, I've been asked to do a keynote, so um, I'm gonna try something a bit different today. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's talk about ordinals. Um, yeah, so the first kind of lesson that, that's very important is on-chain and on-Bitcoin. Like on-chain, on-Bitcoin has extreme product market fit. Um, we've, when we launched this in, in, in January, like we launched it and it was like, an instant success. Like people like flocked to Bitcoin, like wanted to do stuff on Bitcoin because Bitcoin has this kind of latent demand to do stuff on Bitcoin. But beforehand, it wasn't really possible. There wasn't many things to do. So now we just gave them a very simple protocol to do things. And now like you have a lot of high fees, you have these all these new protocols. So now we have inscriptions, which is kind of what we brought out. We have like meta protocols like BRC20s. We have people uh, trading and looking for rare sats and all of this is possible because it's on Bitcoin and it's on chain like we have all these kind of cool features which I kind of just want to like show here I'm not going to go into detail how they work but they work because we're on Bitcoin and because it's on chain uh, and you see this also in the markets with stuff like the BDC dominance going up we're back over 50% um, so yeah so the first kind of lesson is on chain on Bitcoin is kind of is, is king um, and of course, all of this attention has kind of created a little bit of uh, animosity in, in the Bitcoin community. But there is this, this mantra that has always been going around in, in Bitcoin is that Bitcoin is for enemies. That Bitcoin is supposed to be this neutral layer that anyone can use. So I just want people to kind of remember this. Like, Bitcoin is for many people, it should support a diverse crowd of users. And uh, you can't really or shouldn't really do anything against that. Um, and what kind of this has shown is that before ordinals and before inscriptions, we had basically two kinds of people using the network. There was the sound money hodler, which is, you know, they, uh, they bought their Bitcoin, they put it in their hardware wallet, and then they never really transacted again. And the other participant was the Bitcoin extracting miner, kind of the miner that secures the network, but that is constantly kind of trying to get Bitcoin out and having to sell it because it has to kind of secure and, and pay for energy costs. And now with, with inscriptions and ordinals, we, we have this new participant. Uh, we have the circular economy kind of JPEG trader, the person that uses the chain, pays the fees, secures the network. Um, and all of these Participants like are sometimes at odds with each other like miners have different incentives and the the hodler the JPEG trader has different incentives But all use the chain um, and any and every one of them is Important in their own kind of way so that the sound money hardware Really kind of further development of these really secure hardware wallets where you put Bitcoin on it And you can kind of be sure that it'll be safe for years to come then you have the miner of course, which is you know the the, the, the mine secure the network they build out these crazy ASICs, they build out energy infrastructure and they, they tie Bitcoin to the real world, like they, they ground Bitcoin in reality. And now with this new kind of participant, 
you have someone who uses the network regularly, who pays the fees, which is very, very important for Bitcoin's kind of long-term security. Like the long-term security budget of Bitcoin is decreasing, so you need kind of people paying fees to secure the network. And all of these people, sometimes at odds with each other, but yeah, they should always remember that um, Bitcoin is, Bitcoin is for enemies, whatever. Okay. The next kind of thing that came out of Bitcoin being used in different ways and people disagreeing with how it is used is that Bitcoin is now a, the mempool, which is where all transactions land, is the sort of dark forest. Dark Forest is a reference to a very good science fiction book by a Chinese author, called, uh, like, it's a trilogy called Free Body Problem. Uh, I don't want to get into detail what exactly it means, but in essence it means that the mempool is more PVP, that there's more danger in the mempool, that you can be sniped, that people try to filter the mempool. Um, and you, and I just want to highlight kind of two cases of what has happened. Um, so the first kind of, when we launched Bitcoin, a lot of like Bitcoin maxis disagreed with these inscriptions transactions. They were like, we're tricking the code. So there's this very prominent Bitcoin core developer called Luke Dash Jr. who created a, a patch for Bitcoin called Ord Disrespector, which would not allow any uh, reveal trans or any inscription transactions to be put in the mempool. What he was trying to do is to censor the mempool. So he was trying to like censor specific types of transactions uh, from entering the mempool. But this like, was a spectacular failure. Like, not a single block did not like contain any inscriptions. Like, it was impossible to filter because the mempool is very kind of decentralized, and it's very difficult to convince users to run this patch, and of course miners to go against their financial incentives of not including fee-paying uh, uh, Bitcoin transactions. A little bit more successful kind of type of adversary in the mempool was this bot called the Sofon. It's also a reference to this, this trilogy, the science fiction book. Um, and what it would do, it would try to prevent BRC20 mint transactions. So it would see a mint transaction in the mempool and try to snipe it or to, to front run it by paying a higher fee and then setting the kind of the supply to zero. And this was very effective. So I think it tried to, while it was running, it, it, it tried to intercept 200 deploy transactions. And of those 200 deploys, 150 were intercepted, so it had a success rate of 75%. And what kind of this, this shows you is that you can't really filter the mempool. You can only kind of participate and try to create like more high value transactions. So um, if you disagree with stuff happening in the mempool, just create transactions that are more high value. That like if you disagree with that, that, that inscriptions are, are valuable, then just create financial transactions that are more valuable and they will naturally push them out of the mempool. Um, so yeah, the mempool is, is a dark forest. Watch out when you transact. There's a lot more bots, a lot more participants uh, in there and, and, and lurking. Another kind of thing that um, kind of grew out of this, at, at least for me personally, was that the development on board is, was felt in the beginning very uh, adversarial. There was uh, a lot of people like watching every commit we did uh, on, on GitHub. Uh, everything was scrutinized, especially in the beginning. Like people flooded to the GitHub, like opening issues, opening PRs, like also insane PRs, and it was kind of a almost a denial of service vector, like where our attention, like Casey's and mine, was like diverted, like answering some like people's questions on GitHub, like draining our like energy. Uh, it was also very fast paced because we had a lot of like technical baggage we had to resolve and for me this was, was kind of a very new experience. Like I don't know how the rest of like Web3 and crypto works, like if it's also so adversarial and so, so high attention, but, but for me personally this was a very new experience because normally when you, you know, you create open source software, you, like, you're coding on your own, nobody really cares, sometimes you do a release, um, it's very like relaxed, but here like it, it felt like there was all of these monsters like looking over your shoulder and looking at everything you did um, And yeah, there was uh, Also like stuff like cursed inscriptions that kind of came out of that because people were using the software in different ways that we hadn't anticipated and Like all of this attention and all of the scrutiny made it a little bit adversarial to, to kind of develop on, uh, on, on ordinals and inscriptions but most of this, this animosity, that, or this perceived animosity, 
uh, was resolved by kind of meeting people in person. So the lesson I kind of got out of this is that gossip is great, especially kind of gossiping in person uh, at conferences like this, um, because I wasn't used to this. So I, I was like part of the Bitcoin community, but I had never been to like a Bitcoin conference. And in March, it was kind of the first time I went out into a conference and like removed myself from this like virtual relationship with Bitcoin and the people on Twitter to like meeting actual people in real life. And uh, this was uh, th this was a great experience because uh, virtual, there's always like, yeah, this this you, you do, you're interacting with like these PFPs. You don't really know the real person behind it. Um, and then you meet them in person and they're actually good people. And it's so much easier to like, uh, like talk to them and discuss things with them. So yeah, like gossiping in person was a kind of, is a great way to kind of resolve these, these tensions that are built up when you interact online. Um, and a great example of this was the inscription numbers debate. Um, this was kind of, it goes into like, it was a contentious thing that we proposed. And then there was a lot of ways how the community as a whole tried to resolve it. Uh, there was Twitter spaces, conferences, and all of these kind of new tools of like gossiping and like exchanging information really helped kind of build out this community uh, and, and, and form social consensus on things. Um, so I, I think we resolved many things very nicely. And uh, yeah, and now we're in like a very like good space. We have a lot of like conferences coming up, like conferences like this one. Um, where we like, come together, try to like come to consensus what we should do, and then we all go back to our computers, to our respective locations, and let the kind of nodes automate that consensus. But like coming together and having these worldwide conferences has really kind of helped form what defines ordinals, what describe, de defines inscriptions, at least for me. Um, yeah, one of the most interesting kind of things playing out right now, or, or lessons, is that DGENs drive development. And DGENs I mean in a very like good way. DGENs are people who take risks, who take their money, use new tools, like unproven tools, and, uh, and, and risk to, to test things. They also drive a lot of um, liquidity to, to Bitcoin, which in turn drives a lot of funding to developers. So, yeah, I depicted here like this wild casino, and basically this casino funds people creating like these nice new tools. And what we've seen is, and what we've seen kind of play out, and what I hope will play out into the future, is kind of these new technologies being funded through this. So one of them is as PSPTs, which stands for uh, Partially Signed Bitcoin Transactions. It was not very widely adopted or very much used in Bitcoin, but because people wanted to trade inscriptions trustlessly, this kind of technology was built out. Uh, another great thing is browser wallets. We didn't have browser wallets in Bitcoin, at least not really. Like in, in, in crypto, you have like MetaMask and a bunch of other like browser wallets, but we didn't have that in, uh, in, in, in Bitcoin. And now we have like a handful of them, like, like four or five, um, which is also great to see. We have new kinds of explorers as well. Um, we have marketplaces where you can like swap and, and, and then trade um, trustlessly. Um, so yeah, there's like, just a lot of things happening um, and, and being funded through kind of this, this new attention, this new liquidity that has been driven to, to Bitcoin. Um, also a very nice thing is like very specific funding that, that has been received is we, we founded this Open Ordnance Institute, which is basically funds uh, work I do on Ord and pays for the servers we run. And it was funded by some random DGENs on the internet, like we have a multisig and an address and people just send money there and that pays for my work on Ord. So it's, it's very beautiful how, how, how this works. It's very decentralized, it's very anonymous, it's very private. Uh, people just do stuff on Bitcoin and then they donate. Um, and yeah, so that's why I think DGENs really, yeah, really like this, this whole attention will really kind of push, push a lot of development forward. Um, yeah, just to kind of recap, Gossip is great, conferences like this are great. This is where we come together, where we kind of learn about each other, where we learn uh, to resolve conflicts um, and, and see where the community is at. Then development can sometimes be adversarial. It's sometimes weird, but this adversity is like sometimes also just attention and not adversity, but just like 
un, uh, unanticipated attention. Um, the mempool, if you go into the mempool, if you do specific kind of transactions, you gotta watch out. There's bots lurking, there's people trying to filter your transactions, but we should always remember that Bitcoin is for enemies. It's good to have a diverse user base, uh, just you know, sit at the table, transact in Bitcoin. It's this neutral settlement layer that anyone can use. Um, if Bitcoin is for enemies, Bitcoin is for everyone. Uh, that's what we want. You know, we want the world to adopt it. Anyone, like also people we disagree with, but we think if Bitcoin is adopted, this will be better for the world. Um, so yeah, always remember this. And then yeah, the most important thing is build stuff on chain on Bitcoin. Casey already said it. You want to build a legacy somewhere on the most decentralized, the most immutable, the most secure blockchain. So yeah, come to Bitcoin, build on chain, build on Bitcoin, and yeah, build on ordinals. I hope to see you there next year. Thank you.